This video describes the many applications of the Medmont corneal topographer in pre-fitting orthokeratology analysis. When considering orthokeratology treatment for a patient, of course the corneal topography is an important part, and the Medmont is one of the best topographers in the world because of its corneal coverage. It gives us an incredibly large capture area, and it's accurate for the determination of the first lens. One of the important considerations related to the pre-fitting topography is that whenever we do a capture, we're always taking a photo of a moving target. In other words, the patient isn't 100% steady. The tear film is always in flux. So one single topography is never enough. Always take multiple maps. When you have numerous maps to work from, then you're able to say whether the topographies are reproducible. Did I capture the patient when the tear film was smooth and even? Did I capture multiple maps showing the same topography multiple times over? Here we can see our four baseline topographies, our four pre-orthokeratology topographies. And one thing that's immediately noticeable is that all four topographies appear the same or similar. The appearance of the central astigmatism is the same. The flattening of the color contours from the center to the periphery all appear similar. These are very reproducible maps, and that's telling us that it's likely to be an accurate understanding of the eye shape. Again, remember that when we take a photo, we're capturing over top of moving tear film, a patient that may not be 100% steady, especially the kids. So taking these multiple maps gives us great confidence that we have accuracy when you see reproducible images. So never take just one capture. When we pick just one of these topographies, you'll notice that we're missing a bit of superior cornea and inferior cornea. The eyelashes, the lids may be blocking some of the ring reflection, and this can be common in the small fissure patient. One of the things that we need to do is ask the patient to open up as wide as we possibly can. In this case, we could even use a little trick and pull down on the lower lid to move the lid, the lashes, and any tear wedge out of the way so we can get more inferior cornea. One of the advantages of the Medmon is it gives us one of the largest surface areas of coverage with one single topography. But another significant advantage is the Medmont allows for composite topography. That's where we take multiple images in various directions, looking nasal, looking temporal, looking inferior, looking superior, and merge that together with the central images. And that allows us to push the ring reflection to the far periphery of the cornea and build a larger view of the eye shape. So it's highly recommended that you do a composite topography on all of your pre-fitting orthokeratology cases. It's also recommended to use the composite when you're building any kind of specialty contact lens. The reason is the composite gives us so much of this peripheral corneal information where the lens will land down. And as you know, orthokeratology lenses are larger by design. They're 10.6 or 11 millimeters or even larger. So any kind of large diameter specialty contact lens would really benefit from being built by a lot of peripheral data, not just the central corneal information. Next, let's look at the candidacy of this eye for orthokeratology. When you evaluate your pre-fitting topography, what indicates whether a patient is a good candidate, a poor candidate, or one that might be slightly challenging, someone somewhere in between? Well, the first thing that we might observe is to look at the presentation of the astigmatism or the power of the central cornea. To do that, let's go up to Display 
and select the axial map. Remember, axial allows us to assess visual indicators. Does the anterior surface present itself in a way that will bend light optimally to the retina? And here we see a cornea that's relatively spherical. Because it's such a low central corneal astigmatism, we'd presume this would be a fairly straightforward case in ortho K. What else can we look at here in the topography? Let's look at the color contours, especially toward the periphery where the lens will land. Let's follow this yellow contour where we would expect our lens to touch itself down and align on the peripheral cornea. Is that yellow band equidistant from the visual axis in the center? In other words, is the cap of our cornea displaced or is it symmetric and centered to the visual axis? Would we expect our contact lens to center in the closed eye environment? And here we see a yellow or yellow-green area that looks like it's relatively well centered laterally, at least, to the visual axis. So we wouldn't expect a high degree of decentration of our contact lens, at least not laterally. It's possible, considering that we see hot heading north and hotter contours heading south, there may be some vertical displacement, but we wouldn't expect lateral displacement based on these yellow-green contours. Let's go over to the K readings. Here we see an utterly median cornea, 43 and a half diopters. Previous research has shown that orthokeratology tends to work much easier on steeper corneas. It may be harder on flatter corneas. So on a median cornea like this, we would expect this is a good candidate. We could look at the corneal sill, and this patient is indicated to have a relatively spherical cornea, making this a good candidate for ortho K. Another indicator is the eccentricity. Previous research has shown that the higher the eccentricity, the better the potential for ortho K. The lower the eccentricity, the harder it'll be to squeeze out higher refractive changes. Median E value with your MedMon is about 0.65. So the normal rate of flattening in the middle of the bell curve is 0.65. If this patient is higher in eccentricity, then that would indicate this is a better candidate for ortho K. If the E value is lower, it may be harder to achieve the orthokeratology effect, especially on the higher refractive changes. What else can we observe? We talked about looking at the peripheral cornea. And that's an important observation because it will explain to us whether we need a toric or symmetric landing. One of the important values that you want to observe is the sagittal differential at 8 millimeters. This looks at the height of the flat meridian compared to the height of the steep meridian to tell you how toric is the peripheral cornea in microns. In this case, when we compare the height of the flat and the steep, there's a difference of only six microns. This is telling you that this peripheral cornea is incredibly symmetric. There is really very little toricity, only six microns of difference between the flat and the steep meridian. So in every case, the indicators would tell us that this is a good candidate for ortho K. We have a spherical cornea. Um, we have very little corneal astigmatism to push out of the center. We have a corneal cap that appears well centered to the apex of the eye. We'd expect our ortho K lens to want to center in the closed eye environment. The K readings are median. The corneal astigmatism is low. The eccentricity is median and our sagittal differential is low, indicating a symmetric ortho K lens will be called for. All in all, this is a very good candidate for orthokeratology. Here we have another case. Let's begin by going up to display and making sure that we're selecting the axial power interpretation so we can understand the central corneal astigmatism. Here we can see an obvious indication of the orientation and type of corneal astigmatism that's presented. We notice a very regular presentation of the astigmatism. One hemisphere is pretty much a mirror of the other hemisphere. 
But what you'll notice is this astigmatism appears to spread from one side of the eye to the other. This is what you call limbus to limbus corneal astigmatism. Limbus to limbus astigmatism is more challenging simply because the ortho K effect has a harder time pushing that astigmatism or that steep curvature out of the central cornea and eliminating the refractive astigmatism. Now what else could we look at? Again, let's look at the cap of the cornea. Let's look at this green yellow border and we might notice that we're relatively close to the green yellow on the nasal side, but the green is farther out off the topography on the temporal side. That indicates this eye has a little bit of temporal displacement. We would expect our ortho K lens to want to have a slight temporal position of its position and therefore its effect on the cornea. Nothing too severe though, nothing that would give us cause for major concern. Let's look at the K readings again. Here we see a slightly steeper cornea, 44 diopters approximately, and a corneal astigmatism of just under one and a half. Again, a slightly steeper cornea indicating a good candidate for ortho K. And with a corneal astigmatism of less than one and a half diopters, this patient would be deemed very much within candidacy for ortho keratology. Let's look at the eccentricity and we notice a 0.52 flat meridian E value. Remember that a normal eccentricity with your MedMon is about 0.65, and this patient comes out slightly lower, indicating lower potential for effect. Now, if we needed a mild minus one, minus two, maybe minus three, the lower eccentricity is really no concern. But if you were trying to target six, seven, eight diopters, achieving that type of flattening on a cornea with a lower E value might be a challenge. We can look down at the sagittal differential, the difference in height in the periphery between the flat meridian and the steep meridian, and this patient comes up with 36 microns of sagittal differential. At around 30 microns, that's where a toric Corneal GP or toric ortho K lens may provide a better alignment with the peripheral cornea. In other words, consider using toric rigid lenses, toric ortho K lenses, when you have 30 microns or greater of sagittal differential. So clearly, this patient requires a toric landing lens. Another consideration prior to building our orthokeratology lens is to measure the visible iris diameter so we can assure ourselves that we've got the correct custom lens diameter for this patient. Let's go up to annotate, grab our ruler, let's click our cursor on one side of the cornea where we can observe that border between the visible iris and the sclera. Then we'll drag the cursor to the opposing side, again finding that border between the visible iris and the white of the sclera. Our white to white measurement is indicating that we have an absolutely normal visible iris diameter of 11.83. Typically orthokeratology lenses are chosen in the range of approximately visible iris diameter minus 0.8. So that would indicate we should need a custom lens diameter of approximately 11 millimeters. But each manufacturer is slightly different in the way they choose diameter. One final consideration related to orthokeratology lenses. You'll notice in this topography, we get an incredibly large surface area of coverage and data. We have a large topography analysis. The MedMon is able to achieve 10 and a half millimeters on a steeper cornea. On a flatter cornea, it's going to be even larger. The MedMon, as a small cone topographer, is able to stretch those rings to the far peripheral cornea because its focal distance, its distance away from the eye, is fairly short, allowing the rings to be pushed to the peripheral cornea. That's why the MedMon is able to measure such a large surface area of the eye and why it's favored by many 
contact lens experts for the building of specialty contact lenses like Ortho-K. But in this case, you see the benefit of using the composite topography. We'll be able to fill in this peripheral corneal information out here. And if a conventional Ortho-K lens is around 10.6 to 11 millimeters, we want topography data to that diameter where possible. So use your composite whenever you can to try to cover 100% of the cornea to build your large diameter Ortho-K lens. The Medmont is going to be an important tool in your pre- and post-fitting orthokeratology analysis. There's many things that you can do to help you determine the appropriate initial custom lens parameters so that you can achieve the highest first fit success possible.